So for those watching online and of course everybody that's in the building, my name is Julian Peters and I am the Young Adults Director here at The Gathering. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm excited to deliver this message. So um, as I was preparing for this message, a question came to my mind, right? Are we seeing the opportunities that God is presenting us with to help others find and follow Jesus? Are we seeing the opportunities that God is presenting us with in our everyday, ordinary lives, day to day, the opportunities to help others find and follow Jesus? I'm talking about the opportunities that can be challenging, right? The opportunities that help grow our faith, they grow our endurance, they help build our trust and our relationship with him, they help grow our faith, right? Do we see the opportunities that we have or has life created a block in our opportunity to be a vessel? Has a life experience that we've had occurred and caused a block in how we perform as a vessel, right? Do we have the faith to step out in uncomfortable situations because that's where God has called us to be, okay? Like I remember the first time that I was asked to be the young adult director here at the gathering. I'm gonna be straight up with y'all. My response was no. <laughs> No, like absolutely not. I do not want to be the young adult director at the gathering, right? I, I was afraid. I didn't think I was worthy of it. I had so many doubts about it, right? Like uh, I was a child of God, but I didn't necessarily see myself as being a leader. I didn't think I could do it. Like I didn't think I could talk well enough. I didn't think I knew enough scripture. I couldn't quote, quote scripture. People wouldn't like me. I really don't like people. Like there were so many things, there were so many things. I felt like I was awkward. I can't talk in person. Uh, I, people wouldn't understand me. There were so many reasons why I shouldn't. I believed that I couldn't. I believed that I couldn't do it. And that's when God talked to me and he let me know. Because I thought, you know what? I don't have the confidence. I'm not confident enough to do these things. I just don't, I can't do it. And he let me know it wasn't a confidence issue it was a faith issue. It was not a confidence issue. It was a faith issue, right? Because I was a child of God. I just didn't see myself as being a leader, right? But we can see ourselves as child of God, as God's children. But it takes another level of faith to be able to allow God to work through us. It's another level of faith, right? I was going through a transformation. I had just moved from Oklahoma to Arizona, or sorry, from Missouri to Arizona. I had just went through a divorce. Life is going crazy. I'm dealing with all these hurts. I'm going to be honest, I just didn't feel like I had much worth. I didn't feel like I was worthy. I didn't feel like I could do it, right? But again, it wasn't a confidence issue. It was a faith issue. I had fear and doubt. I was hesitant. This is not where I'm supposed to be. But when you peel back the layers, it was much deeper than just a confidence issue. I had a lack of faith in Jesus Christ. I had a lack of faith in Jesus Christ. I'll give you guys another scenario. Aaron, y'all know who Pastor Aaron is? Pastor Aaron. Aaron Dan, family of life pastor. This time last year, she had just become our family of life pastor. And I remember she came to one of our services. She let me know she was coming. But of course, that's my boss. That's the big boss. So I'm terrified, right? Like she's going to be here. She's going to listen. I'm writing a message, putting it together through the week. But I'm kind of nervous, kind of anxious. And I remember I started off the message. Keep in mind, all our young adults are sitting there. I'm getting ready to speak. And I was like, hey, I'm going to let y'all know. This message really isn't that good. That's how I started. This message really isn't that good. And it was a message, I believe I titled it Change Up because I talked about uh, uh, baseball reference because we were going to the spring training game that next week. And the message actually went pretty well. And I remember Aaron pulling me to the side right after, and I think this might be the most mom moment I've ever had with Aaron in my life since I've been at the gathering. She like looked me in the eye, put a finger up, I'm like terrified. I'm, I feel like I'm kind of bigger than Aaron, but like at that point, I, what I do? Um, and she looked at me and she said, don't you ever start a message telling somebody that it's not good. And I'm like, well, why? Well, you lose your audience. You lose the people listening because how are they gonna believe what you're talking about if you don't believe what you're talking about? 
So I went home and I remember I reflected and I prayed on it and God brought that even deeper to me. If you're feeling that you're called to be a vessel, Julian, I'm giving you a message to speak. I've given you the opportunity to help deliver this message to your young adults and you tell them that it's not that good. That means you believe that what I gave you isn't good enough. God has told, God let me know that by telling you that I don't have, have a confidence in me, I have a lack of faith in him, and I'm letting you know while you're listening the lack of faith that I have because I didn't believe in the message. If I'm truly following Christ and I'm listening to him for these messages that we're delivering, there should never be a lack of confidence in the message because I know it's from him. If there is, it's a faith issue. But with that message, with me and the young adults and becoming a director, what I needed to understand and what I want you all to understand, obedience is a skill set. Obedience is a skill set. God is not calling for the most equipped. He's calling for obedient followers. He wants obedience, right? You may be sitting there right now. You might be going through a tough time. You might be questioning whether or not you're good enough. You want to be a vessel, but you really don't believe in yourself. I've been in that. I, I, I've been sitting in that chair and thinking that about myself. But God is not calling for the most equipped. He's calling for the obedient. You want to be a vessel, you want to help others, but you don't see yourself doing it, right? You don't see yourself that way. You're holding on to something. Something is blocking you from doing what God has called you to do. It's time that we start walking in faith. It's time that we start trusting God's plan for our lives. It's time that we start seeing ourselves the way that God views us because we are vessels and we are city shapers. That's what he's called us to be. I want you to start unlocking that obedience skill set. Unlock that obedience skill set. God has a plan for everybody in this room. Each and every one of you, he has a plan to help others find and follow Jesus. To continue building his kingdom and help others find and follow Jesus. But we got to remove some of the things that are blocking us and not allowing us to perform like the vessels that he has called us to be. The title of today's message is Unblock Your Vessel. Say that with me. Unblock your vessel. Let's try that again because that was terrible. Say it with me. Unblock your vessel. Thank you. We are unblocking our vessel. It's time that we start seeing ourselves as vessels. It's time that we start behaving as vessels. It's time that we start seeing the opportunities that God is presenting to us in our everyday lives to be vessels and help others find and follow Jesus. So we're going to go to the story of Gideon. Okay, so Gideon in the Bible was a judge and he was a mighty man of war in Israel, right? God called Israel to deliver the, or to deliver the Israelites from the Midianites. During this time, the Midianites were ravaging the land, ravaging the land, uh, the donkeys, the cattle, the sheep, they were ravaging everything in the land, right? The Midianites were our, was the Israelites' oppressor. They were the power and the oppressor. And so in Judges 6, 7 through 10, we meet the Israelites and Gideon. So when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I'm the Lord, your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. So the Israelites cried out because the Midianites were ravaging through the land, right? And what does the Lord let them know? You're not obeying. You did not obey my, our, my word, right? And so how many times have you been in a tough situation, a tough trial, right? And it feels like whenever you're in that tough situation, a tough trial, like everything seems to be going wrong. You can't do anything right. It feels like everything is crumbling around you, like your world is crumbling around you. I've been in some dark times. Right? I've been in some dark caves. I've been in some situations where I felt like nothing was going good for me. But it's almost like every time I felt that way, I was the one walking in disobedience. Like I talked about my story and about how I used to be married. And my ex-wife came out 
And she chose to find somebody else from a different gender and how that hurt me. And I was so upset and frustrated. But you know where the real reflection came in that? It's when God showed me that really I opened myself up to that by marrying her in the first place because I was being disobedient because we weren't equally yoked. I can't even be mad at her. I got to be mad at myself because I stepped in disobedience. We weren't equally yoked, right? But every time it seems like I put myself in these situations, but I still want to be mad at God. I want to be upset. Why are you letting this happen? All these things are going on. I'm really not doing anything bad, right? I haven't committed a crime. I'm pretty good. I'm doing a couple works. I give a dollar on Sunday to the church. Like, why is this happening? The thing is, I'm not being 100% obedient. I'm not being 100% and obeying his word. And I want y'all to know, there's no lenience in obedience. There's no lenience in obedience. We cannot play the hokey pokey as Christians. We can't have one foot in and one foot out. It's full obedience, carrying out the purpose that God has for our lives. He wants us to obey his word. He wants us to walk out in his purpose and carry out his plan. It is full obedience and God's purpose for our lives. So now we're going to go to Judges 6, 11, 13, 11 through 13. And it says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah. Now, I'm going to go ahead and pause, okay? I love y'all. I hope y'all love me. I need grace. Julian does not pronounce names very well in the Bible, okay? I'm sorry. So I might butcher some of these countries, some of these places, some of these tribes. I apologize. I need your grace in those moments, all right? Like, my bad. So, thank you. Now, Ophrah, that belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into his hands. So the angel of the Lord comes to him, and what does he say? He called him a mighty warrior. The Lord is with you. You are a mighty warrior. The angel of the Lord comes to Gideon when he's doing his ordinary thing, right? He's, he's uh, threshing wheat in a wine press. The reason he's doing that is because that's in a dark place. It's private, and it's because he is in fear because the Midianites are coming, and they're ravaging the land. So he's trying to hide the wheat that he's creating so they won't come and ravage the land. He says, the Lord is with you. God is with you. Hear that. God is with you. You could be in a cave right now. You could be in a dark place right now. You could be in a dark time right now. You feel isolated. You feel alone. Your world is crumbling around you. The friends that you thought were friends aren't there for you like you thought they would be. Right? Uh, I've been in that place. I question my purpose. I question whether or not I should exist on this earth, right? I've been in those dark places, but just like the angel of the Lord told Gideon, I'm telling you, God is with you. You're not alone. God is with you. You're not isolated because God is with you. We got to remember that whenever we're going through a tough time, God is with us, right? Gideon even asked, he's like, well, If you're with us, why is all this happening around us? Like, I don't understand. It may seem like with anything you're going through right now that it's a tough time. God, are you here? God, are you with me? Understand, through the good and bad, God is always good. Through the good and bad, God is always good. It doesn't matter if my life is going great. It doesn't matter if I'm going through a trial. My God is always good. We can't be followers based on a condition. We can't be followers based on a condition of God. If you're, if everything is going right, I'm here for you. I got you. We follow Jesus Christ because we understand that he is good all the time. 
How do I know that God is good all the time, right? You might ask that because I'm up here now talking about a story when everything was going bad and I'm able to share it with you so you can understand how good he is. Even in that tough time and in that trial, God pulled me out of that and I'm able to share that now because he's good all the time. He's always good. Judges 6, 14 through 17, okay? So the Lord, the Lord turned to him and he said, go into the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if not, I have found favor in your eyes. Give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please don't go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. So I did some studying in Gideon, right? And I'm, and I'm reading about Gideon. And the thing I find it interesting is he said, go into your might. The angel of the Lord says, go into your might. And I think the might for Gideon is not how we would normally see might. Right? Like, ooh, mighty, huh? Right? We're not seeing might that way because God went and saw Gideon in his everyday, ordinary life when he was doing an ordinary thing, right? So Gideon had the might of the humble because he was threshing wheat on a wine press floor. He's hiding what he's doing, he's in fear, so he has the might of the humble while he's doing that, right? Gideon had the might of caring because he cared about the low place of Israel. Gideon had the might of knowledge because he knew the great things that God had done. Gideon had the might of being spiritually hungry. He wanted to see God do all the works again. Gideon had the might of being teachable because he listened to the angel of the Lord when he spoke to him. Gideon had the might of, being, of the weak because God's strength is perfected in our weaknesses. Look at Gideon. Gideon God called him to be a mighty warrior, but he was preparing him in his everyday life. His everyday life, his ordinary thing. We may not understand. We may not always see what God is doing, but what we know is that God is always with us and he is always working through us. That's what we can count on and that's what we know. That's even when God calls you to do something. Oh, like, I don't know if I want to do this. Like, this is going to be hard. I don't know if I'm qualified to do this. I don't know if I'm qualified to speak. People don't want to hear me speak. But God's calling you to do this, right? God has called you to do something. It doesn't matter if you're qualified. He's called you to do something. Are you going to be obedient? That's even when he calls you again to do something you're not qualified for. Don't let fear or doubt block you from being a vessel that God has called you to be. We got to start shifting that thinking and unblocking our vessel, right? Whenever God calls us to do something, I want you to think God is sending us and God is with us. He's not going to put you in a situation and not be with you. He's not going to call you to do something and just leave you out there. He's with us and he is sending us. And don't think that Gideon didn't have some doubts. You can read it. He, he, he had a couple doubts. I don't want you to think that you have doubts and like you failed because you have some doubts, right? I had doubts. Y'all heard my doubts. It's when we dwell in a doubt that we lose sight of his purpose. You can't dwell in the doubt and lose sight of his purpose. I could have easily let what the enemy was telling me ruin my opportunity to be a vessel, to help at young adults, wherever it may be. I could have let the enemy tell me all these things about how I wasn't qualified or equipped, or I could take it to God and seek him for confirmation. We have that choice, right? So Judges 6, 36 to 39, Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place the wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand. As you said, and this is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make, let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. 
The night God did so, only the fleece was dry, all the ground was covered with dew. Do you notice how Gideon didn't dwell in doubt? Instead, he asked God for confirmation, right? Instead of questioning your ability, seek God for confirmation. Instead of wondering how you're gonna do something, seek God for confirmation, right? I tell my young adults all the time, discern to confirm. Discern to confirm. Discern or discernment, right? It is the decision guided by the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Apply the word of God. That's what separates the truth from the lie. We apply the word of God. Don't let the enemy fill you or fill your head with lies about who you are. I am because of I am. I am because of I am. God is the I am. And I am because he is the I am. I serve because he is the I am. I had doubts. I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough scripture. I don't speak well publicly. They might not like me. I might not like them. There's so many reasons that I had all these situations, but here's what I want you to understand. When it comes to God and the opportunities that he's promised us, do not believe the lies because God will provide. Don't believe the lies because God will provide. The faith will be the supply. That's what we need. We need to activate our faith and trust in God. Be obedient to where he's called us to be. Be obedient to where he called us to be. So now we're going to fast forward a little bit, right? Gideon defeats the Midianites. In chapter 7 of Judges, Gideon received this confirmation from God, and he leads the Israelites to defeat the Midianites. Okay? During this time, we see the Gideon's army goes from 32,000 to 10,000, from 10,000 to 300. And this is before any battle started. Okay? So the Lord says to Gideon, with the 300 men that left, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Now we're going to fast forward, Judges 7, 16 to 18. And by dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I, when I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord God. God worshiped. Gideon worshiped. He instructed his army to worship. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor John talked about Joshua. How Joshua took his army, he walked them around Jericho, and they worshiped, right? It's a common theme here. It's a common theme. What is it? It's worship. Whenever you feel like you're in a battle or you're going through something, it's time to worship. It's time to worship. It's time to shout out to God and lift your voice and bring his presence into your situation. When we worship, we tear down walls. We break chains. We break strongholds when we worship and we bring God's presence into our situation. Worship on the battlefield and watch the enemy yield. Watch him yield. Watch him stop what he's doing. Watch God put a stop to his tracks. Worship brings God's presence into our situation. There's breakthrough when we worship. I need y'all to understand that God will provide more than we can imagine, right? In Judges uh, 19 and 2, Gideon and the 100 men with him reached the edge of the camp. And at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard, they blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded... The Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Beth, not going to announce that, towards Rur, as far as the border of Ebel, Mehalah, and their tablets. Right? God will provide more than we can imagine. One of my young adults, he's here. You saw him on stage. He's playing a guitar. Burner, right? And Burner is always famous for saying, God did. If I could call him right now, I'd have him come do it. God did. But that's what it is. Right? I bet you Gideon wasn't expecting for that army to turn on each other, but God did it. Right? I shouldn't be up here on this platform giving you a message, but God did it. You done invited some people to church and it took months and months for them to come, but they're here. God 
did it. We don't always understand how, why, but what we do understand is that our good, our God is good all the time. So we're talking about being city shapers, right? We're talking about being vessels. As a vessel, we shape the city. We can't be vessels allowing the enemy to distract us and block us. We need to be performing as a vessel at our full capacity. But did you know that vessels are channels or conduits through which blood is distributed to body tissue? See the vessels up there. In fact, they carry blood throughout our body, right? Our bodies have over 60,000 miles of vessels running through it. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. Now, one of the things that I, one of the things that I talk about being able to pull something that God has kind of uh, shifted me in or helped me when I was going through a tough time is before I got my divorce, my ex-wife was in chiropractic school. And I actually kind of started developing a liking for chiropractic. Like before that, I didn't, you gonna touch my neck? I watched too many Kung Fu movies. Yeah, like I feel like you can just, I didn't want nobody to touch me, right? But then I understood what chiropractic was, but I learned a brief history of chiropractic. There was a time when it was illegal to practice chiropractic in America. It was illegal. In fact, you can see where a doc, one of the chiropractic doctors is adjusting someone in jail. They used to do like adjustments at homes and the police would literally come and rip them out of their homes and take them to jail because it was illegal. But that all changed with Dr. Harry, Henry Winsor. He wanted to test whether or not chiropractic was real. He wanted to design experiments to understand any evidence that chiropractic actually worked. So what did he do? He gets, he just dissects animals and he performs autopsies on humans, right? He had 22 cat cadavers and 75 human cadavers, right? And so he performs these experiments and he found that 212 of the three studies he did, 212 were found to a sympathetic nerve section of vertebrae that showed curvature. That's blocks in the vessels, right? There was almost a 100% correlation between disorders in internal organs and mild curvatures in the spine. You ever seen somebody walking around and they look perfectly fine and then they go to like get a checkup and they have like a health issue and you just kind of shocked? Like, you work out every day, like you eat well. I don't understand. It could be a curvature in the spine that's causing a block to the vessel and there's not enough blood being carried through to the organ and it's not functioning properly, right? But we are called to be vessels. My question is spiritually, what's blocking you from performing at your full capacity to be a vessel that God has called you to be? Are you hurting? Is the people hurt? Are you dealing with some unforgiveness? Are you dealing with some bitterness? Did you serve at another church and it didn't go well and now you're here and you just decided, I'm not gonna volunteer and serve, I'm just gonna come here on Sundays to get filled. Because you're hurting from what happened. What is causing you not to be a vessel? But whatever that is, I got amazing news for y'all. Y'all ready? We got the ultimate adjuster in Jesus Christ. You just got to set an appointment. You got to be willing to set an appointment. And here's the thing about chiropractic. It's not always done in just one time. Like you can go and visit and you feel like, oh, they adjust me. I feel better. Cool. No, like sometimes you're going to have to keep going, right? You might have to go four times a week and then you go three times a week. They develop a plan with you until they can work those situations and make sure that that block is gone. When it comes to our father, we just don't set one adjustment. It's a continual process. If you're battling with unforgiveness, you might have to go see him more than once to really deal with that unforgiveness. We are called to seek him and understand that by going to him for our adjustment, he's going to be able to remove that block for us and we will be able to perform in full function as the vessels that he called us to be. We are vessels. We are city shapers. So I'm going to end with this. A city shaper helped shape my soul. Brian Bowers. He's no longer here with us. But some of you know him, have met him, have a relationship with him. You understand how great of a man he is. And I remember a couple years ago, we we're getting ready to go up to Dude Challenge. And Pastor John had reached out to me about going. I didn't want to go. Then they asked me if I wanted to start a small group. I'm like, I mean, I guess. 
whatever. I don't even like the outdoors. I don't know why I'm gonna start a small group. I don't even wanna be up there. But that's a whole other conversation. But I remember Brian called me and he left a voicemail. And I've actually kept that voicemail. You see the date. I've never deleted it because it's a reminder for me of how good God is. It's a reminder for me of what encouragement and God's love can do for someone because I remember calling him back and he wanted me to start a small group and I told him I didn't want to. I didn't feel like I was a leader. I didn't know scripture. And Brian told me, you don't have to know scripture to lead. You just need a relationship with Jesus. He gave me encouragement and now I'm up here because Brian Powers understood what it meant to be a vessel. That's how we shape cities, y'all. Pastor Erin, when she pulled me to the side and checked me, she understood what it meant to be a vessel. That's how we shape cities. Pastor John, Pastor Michael, Pastor Brad, Brett, Rodell, Kenyon, Dom, uh, Esteban, all the people that I've had encounters with that were vessels and impacted my life, they helped shape my soul. And I can stand up here and let you know that when we are obedient and we are vessels, we can have an impact on people and helping them find and follow Jesus. You have that authority. And I don't want you to get lost in comparison, okay? Don't think because you're not up here that you don't have any type. No, because I know plenty of people that are still here because of what the door greeter did when they walked in. The door greeter made them feel seen. The door greeter showed them what love was, and that's why they stayed. Not because the message is great. Not because worship is amazing. It's because they felt seen by a greeter. Be accept, be accept what God has called you to be and be obedient. We are called to shape a city. We are called to be vessels. Let's go shape this city. I encourage you, if anything is blocking you, to take that to God. Let him adjust you. And let's come together and let's go be vessels and be city shapers. I'm going to pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. Again, we thank you for another opportunity to come together as a community, as a family, as we continue to move out through the rest of our week. We just ask that your presence continue to surround us, cover us, and protect us. And as we go out and become vessels for your kingdom, helping others find and follow Jesus, that you continue to pour into us so we can pour into others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We got people up here for prayer. If you're needing prayer, I want you guys to know that I love you all. Have a great Sunday. If you're wanting to stay for our next service, we're having a worship and prayer service at 1130. We would love to have you there as well. Y'all have a good one. Bye.